managing people was once regarded as an art rather than as a science. But these days, companies have begun to use sophisticated data analysis for all sorts of people-related issues, ranging from recruitment and performance evaluation to promotion and compensation. People analytics, as this approach is called, is making waves in the field of human resources because it is said to eliminate biases that exist in human judgment. Warden plans to host a conference on this topic on March 28th. And today, Knowledge at Wharton is pleased to welcome Kate Massey, a professor in the Operations and Information Management Department, who has been leading this effort. Kate, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, McCool. Very glad to be here. So, uh, people analytics has been described as a data-driven approach mm -hmm. to managing people at work. Uh, I wonder if you could help me understand what that means and how it differs from traditional ways of managing people. Mm -hmm. Well, traditionally, people have made decisions around who to hire, who to promote, who to compensate the best um, intuitively or with some numbers, but maybe not in a systematic way. And people analytics is an attempt to bring a little more systematic processes to these decisions. They're some of the most important decisions that an organization makes. And um, we've seen good use of data in other fields, finance and marketing, and it's just kind of the slow evolution of using those data in, in new fields. So how exact, exactly does that work? Does it really eliminate biases? Well, it helps, and this is one of the this is one of the motivations that I have. I study decision making, and it's very much about the biases people have um, in their intuitions, and these are hard to root out. And bringing some data to the process and more systematic decision making, more systematic analysis, is one way of doing it. Eliminates a big word. Um, I'm sure that there are some situations where we can take in a bias all the way down, but mostly we're just trying to improve. So, so maybe if we were to look at this in specific terms, it would help make it a little clearer to me. Uh, let's start with recruitment. Um, mm -hmm. The first step, uh, which is the first step in a company's engagement with an employee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, say at the University of Pennsylvania, traditionally, if we wanted to fill a job, we would uh, post it on our website. Mm -hmm. We would look, all the re look at all the resumes that came in. We would mm -hmm. look through the resumes to see who are the most qualified people, mm -hmm. call them in for an interview, and then try to find the person who was the best fit. Mm -hmm. Now, now uh, using people analytics, uh, how does this process change exactly? So if, if we were to come in and try to bring some of these tools to that process, probably the first thing we would do would be to look at as much historical data as possible to understand what attributes in these candidates predict performance long term. So can we, can we model just basically, rather than interviewing them necessarily, we can look at their characteristics off of the Vita or um, their application and ask what's the relationship between these observables and long term performance. It doesn't mean necessarily that we'll give that model 100% discretion on who gets hired. But we use that model's output to inform our decisions. So we'll probably still do the interview. We'll probably still have a group discussion. But to have some analytical rigor informing that discussion would be better than most processes which don't have it. So um, the other thing we might do is to model the the admissions decisions themselves. So rather than modeling long-term performance of the candidate, we say, well, what are we doing right now? Who are we deciding to put in? And you can go in and find out, well, whether you know it or not, implicitly you've been putting 20% weight on GPA and 50% weight on the prestige of the company they work for and 30% on whatever. You can just ask, what have we been doing? Even though we, we don't follow some rules, we're implicitly going to end up relying on some rules. That's often enlightening. Organization might not know. It's like, we didn't know that our process put that much weight. Maybe that's okay. Maybe they decide they'd rather shift it and put weight on something else. So you, you mentioned the term uh, 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 being able to predict uh, the performance. How, how accurate are these predictions typically? Well, they're going to vary dramatically, and um, you're, they're never going to be perfect. These are noisy processes. And one of the things that – actually, I think this is a virtue of people analytics. If you're if – you're, if you're, if, you're, if you're really being thoughtful about it, one of the things you carry away is a deep appreciation for how much chance there is, how much noise there is, how imperfect the process is. Even the best model with the best data 
um, is still imperfect. And you know, that's actually an important lesson. We don't typically carry that lesson around about the decisions we make in the interview and hiring process. Usually we think, yeah, I can predict that. And you remember the ones that you predicted well, and you conveniently forget the ones that you didn't predict so well, and you never develop that humility about the process. You start modeling the process, and you start appreciating the difficulty. So imperfect prediction, for sure. But um, the idea is that we can improve, we can, we, can, we can do better, we can be more accurate by adding some analysis to the intuition of the people who are doing the decisions, making the decisions. Right. So I've heard that companies like Google and Xerox, for example, have been using uh, this approach to, to recruitment. Uh, how could have been the results that they've seen? Well, you know, people, it's not all about modeling performance. It can be any kind of analytics applied to these processes. So one thing, for example, that Google did a few years ago was to ask how good are interviews for predicting um, you know, performance on the job. And they discovered that you know, the, the literature says they're not very good. But a lot of times people want to you know, prove it to themselves in their own organization, and Google is strongly that way. So Google says, we'll study ourselves. And they run the numbers and they discover, well, in fact, interviews don't do a whole lot. And um, they serve other purposes, and so maybe you want to not throw them away. But they were spending you know, hours of their manager's time interviewing candidates you know, eight interviews, nine interviews, 10 interviews, and they discover they don't do much, well, let's just cut that back. Let's cut it down to the bare minimum. Let's have three or four interviews. So that's just being more analytical in your decision-making process or being more analytical to improve what you're doing organizationally. Well, that, that sounds very counterintuitive. And I, I remember uh, National Public Radio did a piece uh, about Xerox uh, and, and how they were trying to recruit people for call centers. Mm -hmm. And one of the counterintuitive things that they discovered was that if somebody had a lot of uh, experience working for different, uh, for different call centers in the past, that was not necessarily a good thing. It might just be that they had right. a very high burnout rate and in right. fact that was a predictor of bad, potentially bad right. performance, uh, which I found very intriguing. Mm -hmm. uh, through using people analytics, uh, have there been other such counterintuitive findings and what might be some of them? Makul, I, I'm not gonna be able to share all the details on this one, but I can tell you I got off the phone with an NFL team two hours ago, and this team is putting a great deal of effort into the NFL draft, Many te all teams do to some extent. This team happens to be one that is one of the most sophisticated in using analytics. And um, this, this, this conversation was about they're discovering some things mattering for a particular position that um, nobody would have expected. They're, in the, this is, you know, they're doing new and better analysis and they're discovering that one of the most important predictors is one that nobody considers. And this is exactly, this is another one of the great virtues of let's bring some, an, some data to the conversation. We're not saying turn the decision over to the data. We're saying bring some data to the conversation because sometimes you discover these intuitions or even conventional wisdom that you've been carrying around for years or decades. Um, not only might it be wrong, but it might be the opposite of what is actually going on. Yeah, in fact, I had meant to ask whether this approach was relevant only to companies or whether uh, people analytics can also be used in, in fields like sports. Uh, so, so uh, for example, if a football team like, say, the Philadelphia Eagles uh, wanted to use analytics, how might they do it? Well, they are, they are doing it. So um, they're going to join us at this conference, actually, and it's not just because they're local. It's because they're one of the smartest teams out there on using data. Um, we think One of the reasons we want the Eagles at the conference is that we think non-sports organizations can learn from sports teams. In many ways, it's these people decisions are um, easier in sports because we have so many observables. We, so many, we see so many inputs um, to a decision, so many quantifiable inputs, and then we see so many outputs. We actually see what these guys do on the field or on the court down the road. In fact, if you decide not to take a player, often you'll see how that player turns out in a way that you rarely do in, in, in non-sports organizations. If you hire one lawyer, you don't often track the career of the other lawyer. In sports, you can do all those things. So we can evaluate teams' decisions much more carefully. And they have many more data points to work with. As a result, for those teams who are interested, it's a great opportunity. And some teams are 
have really um, taken advantage of this, the Eagles being one of them. So the Eagles are using data at kind of every point of the process, and they hired a new coach last year who's very data-oriented, and um, we have a lot to learn from those guys because they are investing heavily in that, and we hope to hear from them at the conference. That's great. Uh, how could uh, people analytics be used in performance evaluations? which is typically, I think, one thing that a lot of managers dread because mm -hmm. the idea of giving negative feedback to, mm -hmm. to uh, employees is often quite uh, stressful mm -hmm. uh, for m many managers. One of the challenges with performance evaluations is um, th there's a risk of wanting to quantify, you know, because it's easier if it's not your opinion. You just check boxes or something's observable or measurable and you put all the blame on the number. But if you evaluate that way, then all the weight gets put on these things by the employee, and you might care about some other things, some other things that might not be objectively quantifiable. And so performance evaluations necessarily require a mix of subjective evaluation and some kind of objective measurement. We're never going to take away the subjective piece, but the idea is that we need to be as systematic and, um, and consistent as possible with the with the quantified piece. So, it, you know, this is a very general approach. Then it could be in any attempt to analyze which measures are most reliable over time, which measures, if high one year or high another year, is going to help us. So a classic example is performance in, um, in, in fund management in the investment world. So bonuses are a big part of compensation there. And bonuses are typically related to how your fund performed. Not perfectly, but that's an important input. There have been studies in some places that sometimes, I'm not going to say all places all times, that say the relationship between a fund manager's performance in one year is kind of unconnected to his performance in the next year. And if it, the idea is, if that's true, then we probably shouldn't, that means that's an indicator that there's a lot of chance in this process and that these differences are not functions of skill. And if they're not functions of skill, then maybe we shouldn't be rewarding them heavily each year. And that's a hard case to make, and it's hard for people to appreciate if you just talk about it. But if you bring data, and you run the numbers, and you do you know, kind of a thorough study, you might be able to convince them. And you can actually figure out how much of this is persistent, skill-based, and how much of it is chance. Can you use uh, people analytics to evaluate uh, leadership potential? That's interesting, and I think it's kind of, I know less about this because fewer organizations are doing it, but it has to be the case that there's potential there, and I'm sure there are organizations that are already doing that. It's hard. I've uh, had a conversation one time with um, a person who had come up through the people analytics organization, part of the organization, and then moved to talent management. And in the new role, had a, um, part of her job was to decide on promotion to kind of the executive level. This was the key promotion level in the organization. And I had worked with her for you know, a couple of years in the people analytics side of things, and, she, and, and she's got a PhD, and she's very data-oriented. And so when I see her for the first time in this talent management role, and we're talking about this critical decision the organization's making about all these employees, I just assumed that there would be like a model and some data, and she'd be using analytics, and she's like, oh, oh no, we, we can't do that. That's like too important a decision. To, <laughs> so I'm in so much trouble if you in this position feel that way after all these years. I mean, but that's, I'm sure that over time it's going to become, um, it's going to play a role there. And um, it's a harder thing, clearly, but that kind of makes it fun. You know, what is it? What is it that we could observe about um, employees early in their career that would tell us they have exceptional promise? It's an interesting, challenging, important question. And very closely related to leadership is uh, the whole idea of teamwork because so many companies require uh, employees to work in teams. Mm -hmm. And increasingly these teams are not just in the same location, they may be in different cities, maybe mm -hmm. even different countries, different time zones. Mm -hmm. uh, can people analytics tell us anything about how team, teamwork can become more effective? Um, I, I would like to think so. It's, it's hard to imagine you couldn't. And again, one, I mean, the way to think about it is just very generally, 
it's it's just it's just analysis essentially. It's just taking it's just quantitative analysis. The the leap is we don't typically think about doing it for this very interpersonal or traditionally soft issue. So it's simply what how can we measure something about the group that would allow us to to say something. So this is a great example of where sports is informative. Um, now, how we translate it to sports is a challenge and it's going to take time. But for example, in hockey, they've had to learn how to evaluate players even though you never see a player on the ice by himself. You always see him on a team of you know, six people, um, five guys, three front offensive, um, whatever. Basketball, same thing. You have to figure out how to evaluate a player on the same – in fact, he's not only just on the court with five of his teammates, he's got five opponents as well. And so they've had to come up with ways of evaluating the group, team performance, that reflects something about the individual. How do we pull the individual out of that group? And teams are getting more and more sophisticated at how to do that. Maybe there are things that we can borrow from the NBA that would help us better understand group performance on an engagement team at McKinsey, for example. Uh, what are some? What do you believe to be some of the greatest concerns about people analytics? I mean, are there issues of, um, uh, for example, how, how do companies draw boundaries around uh, the privacy, the use of data and metadata? Yeah, uh, are, and is there any regulation around these kinds of issues? Um, that's a. That, I don't know the answer on the regulation side. It is certainly a sensitive issue, um, and you know, I've seen changes in company's willingness to collect these data, even just in the last three or four years. Early on in a, in a, in a conversation at one organization, we were talking about how can we make use of, um, how can we gather new data to evaluate what's going on? And we were talking about organizational culture at the time. And I was sitting next to a sociologist, and this particular sociologist's specialty was studying like 12th century church. And you know, I'm, I'm much more of a psychologist, and if I think about data, if I'm going to get really creative on data, it's going to be something like, you know, cortisol or something. And it's funny, co companies don't let us collect cortisol from their employees. This guy is a guy who had to be very creative about um, collecting data. He studies 12th century church, and he came up with this idea of what, what, how can we monitor passively what, where employees are. Like, and we had all these interesting ideas on, that might actually say something about the organizational culture. I was very impressed. That was from this very different um, disciplinary perspective. At the time, that seemed, even that seemed scary. The organization was like, oh, we can't do that. And now you read about this. You read about you know, little IDs on badges that capture where everybody is all the time, or um, meters on chairs, so they'll know when people are actually using space. And they are, that's where the world is going, and it is scary to some people. It's obviously rife with some ethical issues, and that is a risk. Um, clearly, that's a risk. And one last question: is If you look, if we were to look to the future, uh, what what do you think people analytics will be able to do, say, five years from now, uh, that it can't do today? That's interesting, McCool. It's gonna. It's got to come from the big data side of things and the passive data side of things, I would think. Um, and again, I look at kind of the frontier of this is in the sports world, and to watch what they have done in the last five years is to see, I think, where we're going to go in the next 20. So the NBA, for example, now tracks every player and the ball multiple times a second throughout the game and then given enough computing power and enough PhDs some people have been able to go in and do some really good performance evaluation with those data. It took a lot of resources and it took some good thinking but they have come up with incredibly insightful performance evaluations based on based on those data and I think we're just going to keep on discovering more and more examples like that as those kinds of technologies filter down to non-sports teams. Great. Well, uh, Kate, thank you so much for speaking with Knowledge at Wharton today, and uh, good luck with the conference. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate it.